Hey, welcome back everybody to episode 59 of my podcast. And today's episode is also brought to you by ProBalls.com. ProBalls.com is a statistical platform that features over 75 leagues around the world. And if you're a statistical nerd and like to research some crazy things from players and their past, their career, uh, there's some very neat searches on there that you can find obviously their career highs, career lows, but also their teammate search I find very interesting. And I also always like to quiz my guests on their teammates that they had in the past. So if you're a statistical nerd, please go to brolaws.com and check out that platform. Thank you very much. And today's guest is none other than Anthony Goods. Anthony Goods is a good friend of mine and honestly felt like we've known each other forever, but I'm sure he gives off that vibe to a lot of people just because of how easy it is to talk to him. And today we talked about his life as a scout on the road, not necessarily him scouting for the Detroit Pistons, but more so the lifestyle and the routine that he has on the road. We talked about his path as, as a player from the G League to Europe, back to the G League, back to Europe, played in Israel, France. At the end of the day of his career, he played in Kosovo, also played in Venezuela and told a crazy story in Vene from his time in Venezuela, how he got kidnapped. So you have to listen to that one. Um, and then we talked about his other passion, which is Swiss cultures and it aligns with his regular job very much so. And he talked about how he founded it, how, how much passion goes into it, how he sees content basically everywhere. And uh, yeah, he's just a very fascinating figure to talk to and talk about life, talk about different topics uh, uh, about life. And I uh, really urge you to listen to this one. It's very interesting. And it was just an easy chat with Anthony Goods. Thanks for being here. Bye. Anthony, what's up, my man? Man, what's happening, B? How you doing? Thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. I appreciate you opening the doors for, you know, me, a lonely guy like myself, you know, <laughs> <poor land. laughs> lonely guy. Man, we're going to talk about the loneliness on the road. That's that's one of the things. We're two, two NBA scouts. Uh, making the rounds around the world and going through in and out of hotel rooms. And uh, we're going to get to that. But I wanted to first start off with how is your life after getting robbed? How, how is, uh, did you, <laughs> are you, are you getting back everything in line your passport situation? Everything is getting, getting cleared. Yeah. Yeah. I got my passport. My last step is, uh, is getting my, my Spanish visa back. So I got to kind of go through that process, like not completely from scratch, but like halfway through. So I have to go through a couple more meetings and, uh, to get it, to get another one, but everything else is fine. I got my passport, got my credit cards, got a new cell phone, uh, new backpack. I mean, they got everything, you know what I mean? So, uh, um, yeah, tell, tough, tell the people tell the people what happened when that when you were in uh in barcelona yeah man so i just went to the beach in barcelona because who doesn't go to the beach and i just like to run i don't get in the water so uh yeah i went for a run and i had my backpack in the trunk um i was actually on my way to go to a game after and then um uh, yeah uh i came back window was busted it's funny because i opened the trunk and I didn't see my bag. And I'm like, am I in the wrong car? <laughs> like, you know, something's <laughs> off. I'm like, whose car is this? Like, somebody just left their trunk open. And then I look and I saw the side window was broken. And um, yeah, they stole my bag. So, you know, I, I found I saw them find my iPhone that the uh all my belongings were on the uh, north side of town. So I kind of went on a manhunt and then uh <laughs> had to cut that, that short, go to police office, file a report and yeah, I uh, spent a couple more hours manhunting and didn't find anything. So, uh, yeah, then I just started making plans to head back to the States so I could get a new uh, new passport. Ch chalked it up to the game, huh? Yeah, yeah I, uh... you got charged it to the game, man. It's Barcelona, man. That's, that's what they say. It's funny, man. Coming from the States, you know, we, we, we have an arrogance. You know, uh, Americans, we just think uh, we know our country's crazy. So because of that, you hear so much crazy stuff. We think that, like, other places – aren't as uh dangerous or whatever it may be and everybody's telling me oh yeah they steal a lot in barcelona and stuff like that i'm just like you know i'm pretty careful yeah uh, no one day and the one day they catch you slipping man you yeah drive, so. <laughs> that sunny day turned dark real quick <laughs> man man i was hot i was hot but i you know I, I know that feeling because I I had a I had a similar situation. It was just in in Moscow when my first it was actually my first 
two weeks on the job, maybe. And okay. I was like this naive kid coming from a small town, coming into a big city. And I always like like I always grew up in a really secure environment, safe, nothing, nobody ever robbed me. I mean, I, I did I did have instances in, in, in teenager years where I got robbed, not at gunpoint, but with a with a, like behind the jacket, some knife or something. Mm-hmm. It was just kind of mm-hmm. so that was a scary moment when I was young, but that was in person. That this this one in Moscow was just kind of like you. I put my backpack behind my um I, I put it from the front of the of the of the car to the back of the car right behind my chair mm-hmm. and kind of like I was cognizant of that so somehow I felt like okay then I'm, I'm kind of gonna I'm not gonna leave it out there for everybody to see but it's still in the back and somebody was in a truck behind me in the van in the yellow van and they obviously they saw me put in the bag behind it I guess and I registered it afterwards. I just kind of put things together because I was walking by and I saw these two dudes sitting in this van kind of, and I just kind of like, it was shady, but I was like, okay, maybe they just sit in the van on the phone. Cause they were just kind of had this phone open. And I walked around with the, with the assistant coach, we walked around the corner to have some lunch and uh, grabbed some lunch actually to go. So it was like a five minute, it was just a quick, quick get. And I'm coming back and my, my, um, the the electronic lock like the the one that you use with the with the beeper you know just it didn't yeah. work it was kind of like it was stuck it was just, it's not opening it's not there's no signal nothing and i get to the i get to the to my car and i i get i see through the window and the backpack is not there i'm like oh no like then the feeling the feeling when you don't have to like it's gone and you feel like you've been robbed you like you know you've been robbed you're like this is that's the worst feeling it's just kind of like yeah. what have you just this panicky, this adrenaline starts coming up. You just don't know what's what's going on going on. And I had to open the door with the with the key itself, old school style. And mm-hmm. then the alarm went off. So I knew some something was off with electronics. So they told me later that they usually lock the signal through a phone. That's why the people that's why I registered when I saw those two guys on the phone in the van. They locked oh, they, okay. they blocked my signal from lo- blocking the door. And then when they, they went in and uh, opened it up, and then somehow they they um they locked the door back up with the signal. I don't know how they did it, but and and then and then it was kind of a clean robbery, but a quick one. And they were really professionals. I saw my laptop was gone, my scouting reports that I was working on were gone. Everything was gone. Yeah. Luckily, luckily, and it's, imagine I'm, I'm at, I I went to the Tesco and I was like, this is my first two weeks in the job, and I lose everything. I look right. I look like a fool. And Jared Holden was there. Luckily, somebody from the States was coming at that time. And they they brought me a laptop, a new laptop. And I, I had sent one scouting report out to a friend uh, to take a look at it, you know, just to have in in, in, the, uh, in the database. I had one in my in my, in my folder in, in, in an email mm-hmm. outbox. And that was the one that I used to rebuild everything from. from. It was just kind of like, man, that, that it was so much work, but it was it was something that 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 the thing the, the thing itself that you get robbed that's the scary part that's really odd yeah for sure and i felt like i don't know if you felt the same way but i had i don't know if i don't know if i could call it survivor's guilt but like afterwards i was thinking about like every candy bar I stole as like a little kid like i don't even <laughs> believe in karma but you just have all these thoughts yeah. you don't have anything else to do it is like what did i do to deserve this <laughs> yeah, yeah everything is coming back at you right now uh, i i did i did steal some candy when i was young when i was real young i was like eight seven years old eight years old and mom i told my mom that because i was so innocent i told my mom i told, i stole some candy and she's like what are you doing you crazy because we're in germany we just moved to germany like mom i'm just gonna share it with this girl i, I stole it for that girl uh, <laughs> i was like uh, the romantic stealer when i was uh, <laughs> so. <laughs> um so all right so today we're gonna talk about a little bit of our scouting life just the just the in and out of of in and outs of our job then we're gonna go a little bit about your playing career because you had a you had a pretty interesting path that that was going through different cultures and i'm curious about how you adapted and adjusted and what mindset you went into it uh, while you're moving from country to country mm-hmm. and then we're going to go into the afterlife which is afterlife is is kind of the scouting life right now but the the creative life we're, that we're both living right now of how we how we balance and and and, and you particularly balance all the all the uh, projects that you got going on but starting mm-hmm. off with the scouting the in and out of the hotel rooms the the finding a routine the getting from country to country, from flight to flight, hopping on and off. People don't really recognize or understand of how 
um, how strenuous it can be. But I, I was wondering, how do you schedule yourself ahead of time? How do you prepare yourself for the trips? And you know that you're gonna like, do you do you look to find a routine? Because there's there's in our job not hardly ever two days alike. So it's kind of like we have to find a way to manage ourselves, manage our health, manage our workouts, manage somehow uh, our, our, our job while we're on the road and work on the plane. How do you deal with everything and how do you go about it? Yeah, usually, I mean, I do try to uh, block out my days, block off my days. So uh, usually I try to watch games and everything either in the morning or at night. So obviously if there's games like last night, you know, there was like Euro Cup games and, and things of that nature. Um, so I'll watch games at night and then in the morning, if I need to catch up on something, whether it be an NBA game or whatever it may be, I usually try to watch that like first thing in the morning, like I'll slide it in my bed, you know, even before I'm yeah. out. Cause I don't really need to be sitting on a, at a table for that. Um, so I, I do that, you know, from home and then I try to work out and, and then I start getting into more of my uh, creative work, usually like, uh, early afternoon. Uh, maybe even early evening. Uh, but usually I try to save early evening for phone calls or whatever I might need to do. So I usually try to keep up with that routine. If I'm traveling, um, back when I had an iPad, RIP, or <laughs> <laughs> when I had an iPad, I would download games and keep them on my iPad because I'm I'm very, I'm very much the type of person I try to take advantage of every moment that I have. So even when even when I used to like live in California, I used to drive a lot. Right. And I used to spend like four hours a day on the road, four to six hours a day. I'd just be driving just because LA is just crazy. So I decided my homeboy was like, yo, turn your, uh, turn your car into a classroom. So I would turn, I would turn on like podcasts or I would try to like learn things while I was in the car, at least two, uh, two hours of the day. You know what I'm saying? So I was doing yep. that every day. Um, so now when I'm traveling, uh, I think it's best if I download a game, put it on my iPad and, and, you know, I don't sleep much on planes, so I'll try to watch a game while I'm on a plane and I can still listen to music. I can do, you know, everything else I'll be normally doing, as, but yeah. instead of staring at the ceiling, I'm watching the game. And then obviously, you know, you land, take a nap, head over to the game and uh, do dinner if you have to and then, you know, go home. But um, that's kind of the schedule. I try to think of my days in blocks, um, especially because I'm so tied to the United States. And I know my first half of my day, nobody's really bothering me because the state's asleep. Yeah. Yeah. So I really try to get the important stuff done, you know, in that first half of the day. You you work out in the hotels? No, nah, see, I like to work out outside. So um, as long as it's not super cold, because I don't like traveling with a lot of clothes, uh, as long as it's not super cold, I'll go run somewhere. And, uh, you know, I'll do push-ups on a park bench or on the street. Like, you know, <laughs> I, I get, get in that prison I, workout in. <laughs> hey, for real. I do pull-ups on a tree branch if it's out there. I did too. I did too. <laughs> you know, I'll do all that. Like, I don't care. I'll probably look crazy outside. But I, I just prefer to be outside, you know, get some sun, get some fresh air. Um, spend enough time in the house sitting at, a, sitting at a chair. So it's like, why not go work out outside? And that's kind of what I got into uh, just even in my playing career, I had a trainer. We used to always work out outside and we never yeah. touched weights. We was always push ups, pull ups and stuff. So I just kind of carried that on. Interesting. So you still, you still do this just body weight workouts. Yeah. 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 I don't touch a weight for real unless it's like raining outside or snowing and I'm in the gym, but I'm still going to be doing push ups and pull ups. But uh -huh. um, I, I rarely touch weights. Uh, I just kind of, yeah, just kind of get the uh, the the body body weight workouts, man. And Interesting. Sculpt, and sculpt this physique you see before you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I do. I I'm I'm in a good vibe right now in terms of working out, but I do use weights, and it kind of feels like. Um, maybe my body is too light is that the push-ups are not interesting in <laughs> I don't know. No, nah, no, nah, I got a workout for you. I got a workout for you. Yeah, all right. All right. I got a workout. So I used to train. So my first year out of school, I hurt my hip. So I was out like pretty much the whole year for like nine months. So I started training at this boxing gym. They were super cool. They started letting me work out with the pros when the pros would come like early afternoon. So I started working out with the trainers. And then so you know, boxers like. That's Some of cardio. them don't really need to put on, yeah, they don't really need to put on masks and they train a whole different way. Yeah. So it was kind of cool, but I got with one of their trainers and he used to make us go through this push-up routine where you max out as many push-ups as you can, right? This is the first rep, as many as you can. So let's say you get 30, 40, 50, whatever it is. 
Then you rest like literally like three seconds, three or five seconds, get one. Cause it's going to be a struggle, right? You just yeah. maxed out. So you get one. Then you rest three to five seconds, you get two. And it's kind of like a pyramid. You go all the way up to 10, all the way back down to one. So it's like 200 and something pushups, but it's like your, your biceps are like it pu- it pumped. Everything is, everything is, it's crazy. Everything is about to explode. So um, that's one that I kind of throw in there, but uh, I mean, there's, there's a lot of ways to make things challenging. And usually it just has to do with muscle fatigue. So like, even if you're doing body weight squats, like do a hundred body weight squats. First of all, you're going to be tired if even if you even get to a hundred and yep. then just reduce, you know, the time in between sets and now go get 20 and then do 20 more. And then you'll slowly, st- you'll quickly start to feel it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So there are ways to do body weight workouts and make them challenging. Uh, yeah, I, I did. I did a lot of, you know, like, bicep then you go into a different different mm-hmm. uh set like you just the the i don't know diamond i think the diamond push-ups yeah, yeah, diamond called push-ups, yeah. jay-z push-ups you can call it jay-z <laughs> <laughs> uh then i did the tricep push-ups where you do it tight so i was going back mm-hmm. and forth and i, I do the warm-up sometimes with the with the um how you how you call the, the jumping jacks mm-hmm. you do the jump, jump one jumping jack one push-up two jumping jacks two push-ups three jumping jacks three push-ups you go all the way up like you said a pyramid to mm-hmm. 10 if in, uh, like in the early on, you're not going to get 10 and then go all the way down to one. So you might want to start with going up to six and then down. And then at, after a couple of weeks, maybe to eight and then down. And then, so that was, that's a good warm up. It gets my whole body going. And then I go into my, um, like I do some rubber band workouts. I, I do like rubber band workouts and, and something for my legs, for my upper body, just kind of get, try to get the deep, deep tissue muscles going somehow. Yeah, no, nah, it's all, it's all great stuff, man. And, uh, and I'm and I'm thankful because you know I think a lot of people feel like they can't work out unless they're at a gym. And you know I'm thankful. My trainer back in the day, uh, Frank uh, Matrishano, he's a close friend of mine. So like we were training. Like I don't know if you remember uh, the ESPN did a docu series uh, called The Rookie with Blake Griffin. So Blake Blake yeah, and I yeah, were coming yeah. out the same year. So like Blake and I we were doing pre draft with Frank. And so we're running up sand dunes, carrying like 70 pound, like sandbags and <laughs> doing all these squats and pushups and pull-ups and stuff at like a kid's park. And um, ESPN was there, you know, they were filming for like three or four days, but, uh, and then Frank, he always wears a mat when he's on TV. So like he was on his like crazy Frank. Gilbert Arena has been talking about him on ass and stuff, but um, you know, I, I was really thankful. Obviously back then I, I, got, I was in terrific shape. But uh, I was really thankful because it showed me that, like, I don't need, I just need space. Like, I just need a living room. I need a yeah. hallway. You know what I mean? And, you know, uh, I can get a, a quality workout, at least for me. That's uh, the, the those outside workouts on the hill. Like, I had in high school, I went to a high school in the States that was in the South in uh, in Louisiana. It was a football school. And they had this hill that they ran on. You know, it was a little bit steeper on one side. It was a little bit flatter on the other side. And we, with the basketball team, had to do it too. But then, like, it was called, you know, like the hill, like the the hill. Right. So, and, and and we would start working out. We started practices in October. And then, if if you mess up, if you like, instead of running suit size, like go outside and run that hill. Like, no, no, like that. That was <laughs> the, the the thing that you really try to avoid at, at all costs. You know that was the biggest punishment. But that outside workouts, and you can always come up in nature. You can find a whole bunch of um, uh, tools to to really get you going. I I'm, I'm creative too. Like I see a, a bench, I start doing some hop mm-hmm. hopping on the bench, some some sit ups or some uh, um, uh, not lunch. Would you? Uh, I'm I'm blanking on the word uh squats just like body so weight squ- body squats, squats. Yeah, yeah, yeah yeah trying trying to help myself just to b- bump back up but yeah you like you can get creative with it yeah um sure. how do you balance personal life with uh with life on the road like did i know i know you're you're going between con- to you know the states and europe a lot and then you're trying to stay in touch with the american side uh then in europe the the you know you're sure you have friends and and a lot of a lot of acquaintances from when you were playing so mm-hmm. How do you go out and see people that you like and still not forget to work and vice versa? Because the the, the social life is it's gotten more important. It's got I'm more cognizant of it than it was five six years ago when I was just kind of oblivious to it. I was you know so into you know, just work 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 work, and now I'm kind of like, no, the personal life is kind of it's it's a big thing, and and uh, and that's probably the main thing. And I don't I don't know how to uh, maybe you can you can update me on on your how you go about it. Yeah. Um, 
honestly, like I, I don't have, I don't have much of a social life. Like I don't, um, things get busy. It depends on the time of year. You know what I mean? I think that, uh, like, I think this time of year, obviously with the amount of video studies and all that other stuff, like I'm not gonna have much of a social life at all, but, um, I, I don't sleep well at night. So because of that, I'm up like this morning, I was up at 5 a.m. When you, when you text me, earlier. Yeah. um, I'm up, up at 4 a.m., 5 a.m. Um, I, I don't sleep much. So it's like, I need to rest. And a lot of times after I travel and I come home, I don't want to go out. I don't want to go to restaurants and all that other stuff. Like, cause I've been there. So it's like my social life kind of exists on the road. Like, you know, I see, you know, guys from other teams or whoever, you know what I mean? I get to, you know, I get to talk to them either at the game or at dinner or whatever it may be. Um, when I'm home, it's funny. I got a friend here in Madrid and he's like, I only see you at the games. <laughs> and we live like 15 minutes away because it's like when I come home, I need like two days to just chill. Yeah. And then after two days, I'm traveling again. So it's like, you know, it's it's tough. But yeah, I mean, there are times like, yeah, because I'm not I don't like going to clubs and stuff like that. Maybe if somebody's in town, we'll go to a bar or whatever. But uh, usually I just like to go to restaurants if I'm doing anything socially. Yeah. Um, but yes, like, honestly, it's usually like twice, two, three times a month that I do something socially, like here in Madrid, most of the, most of my social activities is on the road. And then when I come home, I'm very much a homebody in the house. I work out, talk on the phone, uh, with my friends and family back home and just catch up back there. And that's, that's about it. Yeah. That's, but you have a fiance, right? If I'm not yeah, missing. Yeah. yeah so. Yeah. How how do you how do you deal with that on being on the road? How often you communicate to balance out the relationship part? Because that's where a lot of lot of all lot day. of people struggle with that all day. All day, all day. If I can, I mean, she works. Um, she works. You know, obviously nine to five and stuff. So uh, we usually talk in the morning before she goes to work, and then um, then we, you know, if I'm up late, then you know I'll talk to her like after the game. But, we'll, yeah. you know, we'll text throughout the day, depending on the day. Uh, yeah. And I think that in regards to relationships, you know, I, I think everybody just has to figure out, you know, what style, of, how much communication and what type of communication you and your partner needs. You know what I mean? So it's like it, it differs from person to person. Some people may be texters. Some people may be on the phone. Some people may like the FaceTime. I personally yeah. hate FaceTime. It's on like and you, and you guys gotta kind of figure what that what that is as a couple but because of that i've been flying home to miami once a month so any free like i'm back on that bird going to miami so it's uh i've been getting a lot of miles in uh this year <laughs> so that's the that's the best way to kind of kind of balance it but uh yeah man i think the the social aspect i mean and, and again it's different but i will tell you this when I first moved to Madrid, I really, I thought it was going to be cool. Just like when I was playing overseas and like, oh, I know all <laughs> these players here, there, whatever it is. And I quickly realized the difference now versus when I was a player is, is like, as a player, I had practice every day. I was touching base with guys every yep. day, like my yep. teammates and, you know, and, and more specifically, even my American teammates. So you got that touch of home every single day, whether you wanted it or not, you was going to get yeah, it. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. You know, and it was like quickly no here. Like I would go days without seeing people, you know what I mean? Um, seeing somebody I knew like that. So uh that was that was an adjustment. But I mean, I think now like, you know, you you adjust and you get more comfortable and then obviously just staying helps as well. Um, so yeah, man, it, we're all different though, man. And we all got different needs at different times of the year too. Yeah, this seasons without seasons within seasons, I, I I like to call it. There's there's a lot of you know there's ups and downs. Everybody's dealing with something. At some time you need more social life. Sometimes you want to be a little bit secluded. There's there's it's it's different for everybody, like you said. And I think for me it became a little bit more not a I wouldn't say a top priority, but it is it it's gotten more important. And when I'm in Vilnius, for example, at, during this this season. I like to get in touch with people. I like to go, you know, like, let's go walk. I have this one friend that we always just kind of walk around at night and we go and go maybe to a bar, just talk about life and talk about the things that are going on just to kind of have this 
you know, you have a person that you really can connect with, you kind of also want to hang out more with them. And it's, it's naturally, it, it gives a good balance and a good you know, alternative to, to work, you know, because when my mind is always on basketball, you can drive yourself crazy as well. So that's why we also, I'm sure we, that's also why we're doing the creative parts because it kind of gets your, your blood flowing a different way in a different direction in different ways. It, it just kind of, it's a different stimulus. Yeah. Yo, I got a question. I was talking to somebody the other day. Do you think, do you think you could be an introvert and be a scout? Uh, it it would require it would require some work, but I think you can. You just have to get up for those moments. You just you wouldn't be able probably to network as as well. I I, I hate to call it network because it's not a network. It's more like Mike Schmidt said it the best when he was saying it's more creating friendships. Like you're trying to create friendships on a road. You're trying to create friendships within the business, and those become then your your allies to to a degree, right? So you you're you're making friends on the road so naturally if you're an introvert it depends on how you normally make friends it it might not be just a cold approach but within the group you kind of warm up to people as time goes on and then it just would take a little bit longer i think to get acquainted with that person and build that network out and build that trust out you know some people are more outroverted i'm definitely not i'm i'm i wouldn't say i'm completely outroverted but depending on the situation i'm more on that spec on that side of the spectrum like above average to 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 high but it also like and i i like to share personal stuff because that's how i connect i i i i don't mind to reach out and talk about my life talk about my problems and then you kind of you show you 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 show the first step you make the first step the other person is going to realize that you're really open up you're being vulnerable and then they're going to open up it's going to build a relationship much easier and i i I build friends around around the world that way because it's that's to me that's how I make friends in regular life. I mm-hmm. that's how I you know in cafes I just talk I I see something I talk to random people. Most people won't do it. That's that's an introverted versus outroverted person, and from that things can evolve. But introverted people in the scouting business is just going to take a little bit longer period to to expand that network and to get comfortable because those people have to feel a sense of security. Uh, of you know just not the f- fear fear of putting yourself out there get overcoming that so it's going to take a bit i think it's possible it's just going to take a little bit more work yeah yeah i think it's i think it's possible but you definitely uh i i think it best if you're going to be an introvert you have to be an extroverted introvert if uh, such a thing exists you got to be able to take yourself out of that and go talk to a stranger and then deal with rejection and deal with people not responding or not wanting to talk to you and, and then, you know, just brush it off and not, and not, uh, and not think twice about it. But um, yeah, I always, I always think it's just interesting looking at the different positions in basketball. Cause a lot of people always talk to me about the transition to basketball. Like, you know, what can I do? What do I want to do? And I think a lot of it really depends on, you know, your personality type and, you know, the lifestyle you want to live like do you want to be in the road or do you want to kind of be tied down to a specific city or do you want to just work from where you live now like you know all those things make a difference when when choosing a path 100 percent, 100 percent. everybody everybody needs to find their own path of what you want and uh that's i mean it takes it took a while for me to figure it out because at some point and we're going to talk about the retirement part because that's the thing that you create a new identity basically you have to find yourself rediscover yourself and hopefully as you were approaching retirement, you learn to fi- fig- to find new hobbies. You learn maybe to to find different ways so what stimulates you at the next level so you can prepare yourself for the next stage because it's not everybody every if you stop cold turkey it's it can be tough i mean it it can it can deal you can deal with a whole bunch of things but then we said about rejection I, there's one thing that I listened to a podcast earlier and i I keep hearing this um hundred days of rejection. Have you heard about it mm it's uh, rejectiontherapy.com. I think if you just type in in, in Google 100 days of rejection, uh, then you, this is going to the first thing that's going to pop up. And uh, rejection number one, borrow $100 from a stranger. Rejection number two, re- request, request a burger refill. Uh, three, <laughs> ask for Olympic, sim- Olympic symbol donuts. Uh, deliver pizza for Domino's. Have a tour in a grocery store warehouse. 
play soccer in someone's backyard, uh, speak over Costco's intercom. So you just kind of do crazy stuff that you put yourself out there. You, you that's ninety nine of the times so you're gonna get rejected, but you you kind of go through the through those difficult moments of being rejected and you, you you start dealing with rejection maybe a little bit better and get comfortable with approaching people so that could be a good tool to to get people going over the hump a little bit yeah no I, it's funny man because i remember i read uh when i was in college i had a uh, had an older friend i was playing overseas and he uh he told me about this book it was written by this pickup artist named neil strauss mm. and he's like yo read this book and it's written by a pickup artist. I'm like, man, I already get girls. He's like, nah, it's just going to take it to another level. So I was like, all right, man, I read the book. And then uh, it, it was really it was really insightful and not even just about like getting women. It was really just about communication. And like, you know, uh, in one of his books, he was talking about how like, OK, if you don't feel comfortable just approaching someone or, you know, if you have that if you have that fear inside of you, like warm up throughout the day, just like an athlete warms up before a game. So go to the store, ask somebody what time it is. You yep. know, what I mean, even though you already know the time, just ask somebody what time it is. Then, you know, go ask somebody what time it is and then ask one more question like, OK, how do you get to the nearest Starbucks? And then, like, you know, just slowly start to warm yourself up. So that way, by the time, you know, the evening comes, you've talked to like five strangers already. Mm -hmm. You're going to be mm -hmm. a little more comfortable by the time you had that first date or whatever it may be. So, you know, I, I think that, you know, communicating, um, you know, is a lot like, you know, anything else. Uh, um, you know, we've got to get comfortable with rejection and like anything to get good at anything you have to practice so practice yeah. getting rejected practice talking to strangers i think all those skills are, are are really important yeah that's one thing with 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 when i never was the one to approach and to have that first interaction because of that i always i always used to be it's gotten better uh that's definitely gotten better <laughs> but i used to i used to be really bad with that i was really reluctant and i'm probably missed out on a lot of um opportunities or crushes that I had that maybe they had on me too, you know, like who knows, you, you kind of, you kind of miss on those, those opportunities. But once you get going, I, that then I feel more comfortable talking, but for some reason with women, I was always a little bit more reluctant because of that rejection part. I just kind of not, not was never used to it. And, and uh, I was, I felt more comfortable with strangers that I that had no interest in just talking and making my fool out of myself. But at the same time, I was not capable of approaching a woman and and saying what i think yeah i think but i think the i think a lot of guys struggle with not knowing what to say mm -hmm. to a woman and mm -hmm. i think that the exact thing the exact thing and process that you're thinking sometimes like that is probably the best thing to say so it's like oh man i see this beautiful girl i don't know what to say you could literally go up to her and just be like excuse me um I don't have a lot of time. I can't even think of anything to say, but I really just wanted to introduce myself because if I left and I didn't, I wouldn't be able to forgive myself, you know, yeah. blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And that it's like, it shows humility. It shows vulnerability. And a lot of times, even if she, whether she's interested or not, that's out of your control. But you know what I mean? I think even just saying, you know, something as simple as that um, is an easy way to open conversation with, you know, anybody, you know, um, just kind of just being real. Weird topic, high demand women versus high demand players. Can you mm -hmm. compare the, the 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 situations when you approach a woman versus approaching a, a high demand figure that is kind of uh, looking at you like what's what he's gonna say? There's some judgment there. Is there not no judgment? What do you can you compare that or is that just a theory that sh I should throw out the window? No, nah, I mean I think I think that that theory holds, and I, I've always thought of it in the sense of like let's just say um, uh, a, a woman that's a 10 and like a CEO, like a businessman, um, you know, uh, I, I think they, I think all three scenarios, whether it's a CEO or a, uh, or a player or, or even a woman, I, I think a lot depends on the context in which you meet this person, where you meet this person, how you're approaching them. And then obviously what they're doing at the time, right? Like if somebody's extremely busy, it doesn't matter who you are. You know, what I mean, they'll they'll brush you off. Um, but I think that so even going back to the book, so like even that that pickup artist book, he used to call it uh, he used to call it negging. And that's pretty much like giving like a negative compliment. And you do that to kind of like lower somebody's self-esteem. But he would always talk about it and doing it in a um, in an unassuming or like humbling way, you know. So 
uh like he would talk about like <laughs> it was kind of funny he said like in a book he would take like uh he would keep like some lint in his pocket and he would go up to like a a really attractive woman and he'd be like oh excuse me you got you, you got this sitting on your shoulders has that has that been there all day and then obviously she's just like embarrassed that she has whatever the hell it is it could be a piece of toilet paper or whatever yeah. like she's embarrassed but she's also thankful that you took it away and you know what i mean and now you know you have permission to approach um you know but i always thought about it like you know if i was talking to uh let's just say like a businessman or i was talking to my friend the other day i was like yo go get the most expensive gym membership if there is at uh, I don't know uh, Lifetime Fitness or wherever it is, go to the basketball court and go there to meet businessmen because some businessmen like to play basketball or even if you're at a bar watching the basketball game. The moment you say like, "Oh, I'm a scout for the Celtics" or "I play basketball in college" or "I've done this," you are already the you are the superior in the conversation. Chances yep. are he did not. You yep. know what I'm saying? So now his self esteem is automatically lowered if you start conversation talking about that game. You know, mm -hmm. and and then you can transition into his field where he's a superior and then things are a, a lot more easy to uh, continue that conversation. So I think it's a little trickier with a player um, in, in approaching a player. And that's where I say that, like context and where you guys meet and all that other stuff matters um, because they get approached by people every day. And it's yeah. like to 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 have to know or talk to one other person, it's like what am I getting out of this for once? Because they, they're used to people taking from them. So it's like, what can you give that person, you know, in that moment? So, um, you know, that's where I always think it's, it's good to try to make yourself seem like a peer if possible, um, mm -hmm. or, uh, or somehow elevate yourself by, you know, guiding conversation in a particular direction. That's yeah, I tell people all the time that, cause they're, they tell me like, man, players are so cold. And I said, they, they get a million requests. They have a million people that Dunbar's number of 150 does not apply to them. They have, yeah. they have so many things on their, on their hands. And they, it's, you got to understand them that they, they're just getting approached nonstop. So I totally understand it. it's a protective mechanism that they try to also protect their, their kind of little bubble world, because I, I don't know if I want to live like that either. It's, it's, if you can't even go, to a movie theater you can't live regular life without being approached all the time and asked for 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 a picture for autograph whatever it is so it's kind of it's you i can see that being triggering and at with with the player at some point too that's why he's just going to put on put on this this wall and and shield himself off to everybody who, who he doesn't know yeah i mean i think if you think about it like this like i feel like we all have a certain amount of like social energy a day right so let's just say we yeah. got like a hundred dollars in ones right and every text message every text message you get you give out a you give out a dollar every text message during the day you give out a dollar you give out a dollar you go speak to somebody outside you give out a dollar somebody wants to talk to you, you give out a dollar you go to practice every teammate you give a dollar every coach like by three, four o'clock, an NBA player, he's, he's been through his hundred, like, you know, throughout the day. Yeah. And it's like, you know, people don't really take that into consideration. Just like just the mental drainage of just having to not seem like an asshole or not, you know what I mean? You know, try to protect your brand and your image when sometimes you just want to be ignored and yeah. I just want to walk to the store and come home. Like, you know yeah. what I mean? But they don't have that luxury, man. I, and I remember, so going back to Blake Griffin, I remember it was his second year in the league. I was getting ready to play in the G League. So like I had like a little bit of time and I, I went to a late, a Clipper game and I talked to him. Um, I talked to him after the game. This, no, this might've been his third year in the league. I talked to him uh, after the game and I was like, yo man, like how's it been and all this other stuff. He's like, it's cool, man, but it's like, it's different. I can't go nowhere. Mm -hmm. And I remember when he said that, man, I could see that, you know, because because Blake's a, you know, he, he's a very welcoming guy, warm yeah. guy. He likes to joke around. Um, but, you know, I could tell even even way back then, man, it was kind of like it, it was yeah. tough for him. It was an adjustment. It was a transition, I should, I should say, you know, just not being able to do little things that you're used to doing. You know, you got to yeah. move different. It was. It, I'm. I'm sure it's. It, it. It can become. It can become a burden on on some people, depending on the personality too. Even though you're, like you said, even though an inviting person and a person that's that's so open to, 
to new people, it's it gets it can get draining or just too too much. Uh, Kylian Mbappe, I think, said something like that too. He would pay a a a, a ridiculous amount. I don't. He maybe said like he just he just pay, would pay whatever it takes to just live a normal life for two days. Go out to the bakery, buy some croissants, drink a coffee, and just go about his life. You know, without being being recognized, and that says a lot. You know, be careful if you're wishing for to be famous. That's what Jim Carrey also said. I wish more people would mm-hmm. become famous to understand that, that they don't want to be famous. You know that that's it's not about being famous. So yeah, what do you where do you think Mbappe could go and nobody would know who he is? Um, Tasmania. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, I don't. I don't know. I is don't there know. anywhere? Is there any like anywhere with like a a city and civilization that like an Mbappe or a LeBron <laughs> could mean, go? Yeah, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> is there uh, anywhere they could go where? And I'm not talking about some Amazon island that's you know some tribal island. I'm talking about place yeah, yeah, the yeah. city that they could go and not be bothered. Because, I, I, like, I used to read about, like, Marvin Gaye. I think he used to go to uh, – he used to go to Belgium, you know, mm. for a couple months, and he would just – because nobody would really bother him. He would get bothered a few times, like, here and there. Yeah. But for the most part, you know, and he would, like, grow his beard out and everything, and he'd just go to the beach or or he would just go wherever, to cafes and stuff, and nobody would bother him, and he could just, you know, disconnect and, and create. But I wonder for somebody like a LeBron or Mbappe, is there anywhere in the world they could go and just kind of blend in? I think for Mbappe, maybe it's a little bit easier because of the size. Like LeBron yeah. just was a standout. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Um, standout. maybe a civilization that's maybe not so uh, congested, maybe Alaska. I've never been to Alaska, but it's just maybe in some parts of Alaska where you just kind of don't have don't have such a such a congested uh, area of people that in one place that that are on top of each other all the time um mm-hmm. maybe maybe just one of those countries or states where it may it may not be as prevalent and the states if you you maybe he goes to Idaho or you know some 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 state that is a little little, little bit less in tune with the soccer yeah, country, yeah, soccer yeah. soccer culture and you have still some like city life Wyoming. Yeah, yeah some, like some, something something like that. Yeah. Something like that. Where it's a little bit less less pop now, soccer has become or, or European football. I mean, sorry for all the mm-hmm. listeners. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um that that where it's less prevalent and less 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 of a um civilization that's in tune with that culture and you still have some sort of city life going on. So in in, in one of those states in this in, in the US and, and one of, in within the within the states in one one of those cities, maybe. Yeah. No, I, I... I think I think the states is probably one of the uh, least interested uh, countries in uh, football or soccer. Yeah. Um, from from what I've seen, I think they're like they said. Uh, yeah, it's football, baseball, or American football, baseball, basketball, ice hockey. A lot of these sports are ahead of uh, soccer, as we call it. So, no, nah, that's just I don't know. That's a different lifestyle, man. I don't. Yeah. I don't want it. That, I've always said, man, like. I'd never want to be famous. I'd rather have the connections. I'd rather have the access than the yeah. than the fame. Like, you know, and uh, my friend and I used to always talk about it. Like, yo, like, I'd, I'd rather be Chad from the Neptunes. I don't want to be Pharrell. <laughs> <laughs> like, maybe be the yeah. other guy. <laughs> yeah, be the role player. Be the role yeah, player. Just yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that. I'll do that. I'll set screens all day. <laughs> I'm still on the team, baby. <laughs> um, Hey, they get rings too. They all get rings. We all get rings when we do um sorry to all the tasmanian listeners if you if if i offended you for uh putting tasmania on uh, you ain't going to no jumping jack jackers games or whatever they're called <laughs> you ain't you ain't welcome they got a nice atmosphere over there Tasmania. they do too. they, they, they do. sell out every game they are they, they are they are a basketball basketball culture that's why that's why i was thinking that in 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 that area it's, it's just also so basketball oriented or foot probably footy as well but it's uh the Tasmania, Tasmania as a as a uh, part of Australia, it is very country. Like you go from city to city, there's there's a lot of lot of countryside and a lot of nature mm-hmm. out. Uh, you know, from going from one part of an, of the city to uh, from one city to another, from one part of Tasmania to another, is it's a lot of emptiness. So it is 
it is kind of secluded. That's why that's why was my initial thought. So I apologize to Tasmanian listeners if you are there. Um, let's go to proballs.com. Uh, that's one thing that I wanted to to also test you on, but also okay. see if you if you uh, recognized any uh, kind of uh, let's see. I put shape my share my screen with you. Did you see it? Yes, sir. All right. So I'm going to type in your name. And here you come up. Now, uh, so if I go to teammates, I'm going to do a teammate oh, I search. I like that. I'm 6'4". I grew. I, I grew in retirement. <laughs> there we go. I grew in retirement. Yeah, you, all, those, about. all those push-ups straight out your back. All right. That's what I'm talking about. 6'4". All right. Here we go. <laughs> All right, so if you if you had to guess what was the most common uh, teammate you had throughout your career, uh, if you exclude Stanford from the list because you were there for four years, so obviously there was a lot of um, your right, right. Like so outside of Stanford teammates, which were the teammates you had the most interaction with, or you played the most games with? Um, I would say John Cox, but uh, I'll probably. It might be it's either John Cox, Gil Amatai, or or maybe one of the G League guys. Uh not Mikhail Gladness. Because the G League just had more games, I think. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. Was it was it a G League at that time or was it still D League? It was D League. It, it was, was D League. Huh? Yeah, it was D League. So, so you see, the first uh, nine were all uh, Cardinals, mm -hmm. and Mike Anderson Mike is the Anderson, one. Yep, yep, D League. Uh, I yep. figure, I figured it was one of the D League guys because of, because uh, of yeah, the, this... uh, the 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 amount. And yeah, then you have the first nine. first first European teammate was uh, Ibrahima. Like thirty nine. <laughs> No way we played 39 games together. Well, I guess if they count cup games and stuff. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I guess um, it makes sense. So if if we go if we go to your uh, career, you played you played in various countries. And I, I was noticing that you had four years in the in the uh let's call it G League for now because it's G League now. So mm -hmm. uh four years there, and then you got went to Italy, then you went back to the G League for a year. Ukraine, Israel, France, Poland, Dominican, um, Kosovo. They ain't even got Venezuela in Ven there. Venezuela on, is not. <laughs> Venezuela not in here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we're gonna you're gonna ask me about. You're gonna, I'm gonna ask you about Venezuela, but I was kind of, I was wor wondering about this process of four years in the G, and then going to Italy, and then going back to the G. What was the What was the process there? Did you feel like you were staying too long in the G League, or would you? What was What was your? When did you decide to go over to Europe, and what made you go back to the G League? Man, so uh, everything. I'm gonna just say a lot. It's funny because I've only played with one team for an entire season. Every I've always bounced around like my entire career, which is kind of crazy when you think you know I played. Yeah. I don't know, it was ten, eleven years, but um, a lot of the issues. Uh, so like my first year in the G League, like I didn't play that many games. I was hurt. I knew I was hurt coming into the season, but I just didn't want to say anything. And I got an offer to go overseas. I was like, nah, I want to kind of stay home because I don't know how long I can make it. I don't want to go out there for two weeks and then. So I went to the G League and um, yeah, uh, I, I just, I was having problems. So I just elected to get surgery. Uh, and then obviously no resume. I get back healthy uh, a year later, got to go back to the G League. Um, so that was 2010, 2011. Um, and uh, that's when I had that year with Dakota. So from there, after Dakota, that's when I first went to, yeah, that's the 2010, 2011 season. That's when I first went to, uh, that's when I first went to Venezuela mm -hmm. because I didn't have any money. We were getting paid 13,000 in the G league. So <laughs> by April, you know, season ends in April, that money gone by May. <laughs> so in June and June I was out and it's crazy, man. Cause like, I remember 
like I, the next year when I came back, to, uh, when I came back to the D League, I was talking to one of my teammates. I'm like, "Hey, bro, like, what you do during the summer?" He's like, "Man, I was just selling weed." <laughs> He's like, "I had no money," <laughs> and like wow. I felt him. Like I, wow. I, I was lucky enough to get a contract in Venezuela, and I went out there and played. But it was uh, that's crazy. It's that tough, crazy. but like that's yeah. how. I mean, think about it. You're getting paid thirteen thousand over six months. Like, yeah. That's... 13,000 over six months, kind of crazy. So, especially living in the States. But, uh, so yeah, then I came back to the G League, uh, 2011, 2012. That was a lockout season. I went to, uh, training camp with, um, OKC that year. Once, uh, once they ended the lockout, I was the last cut there. And then, um, I got an offer to go play in Teramo. And so, I went to Terma. I'd never seen that kind of money. I mean, we're talking like going from 13,000 to 120 to finish the season. I'm like, all right, baby. <laughs> like, I ain't never seen that kind of money. I'm buying a new PlayStation, a new controller. <laughs> like, brought my girlfriend with me. Like, what you want? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> she getting all the new makeup. But uh, yeah, then I get there and then I don't get paid, man. They were, they were in oh. extreme financial trouble. They actually ended up folding that year. Um, so I was there two months. It was a nightmare. I wasn't getting paid. And, you, you know, that was my first time in Europe, first time mm -hmm. not getting paid. And I had already heard the horror stories. Yeah. So um, that's when I came home and I finished in the G League right there with the Mad Ants. And, um, yeah, after I came back with the Mad Ants, I was like, all right, man, like, I can't keep doing this. Oh, I'm not making bread thing. So, like, let's mm -hmm. let's just go overseas and, and uh, quit chasing the league. So. Um, that was, that was the, uh, that was the whole mindset by there. So a lot of times when I ended up switching teams, don't get me wrong. There were times where I was just playing terrible and, uh, I got cut a couple of times, but, um, there were also a few times where the money went bad. Like in Ukraine, the money went bad, you know, they didn't have enough money to pay us. So they let yeah. us out of our contract. So I had to leave, you know, in Poland, the money went bad. Like there's just a lot of places, uh, Mm -hmm. where things just didn't work out or you just end up getting into it. And Galil, me and the new coach, we bumped heads from the very first day. <laughs> and uh, they ended up working out a, a transfer for me to go back to Messiona. So um, different things happen over the course of my career. But I think now, you know, I'm scouting. The good thing is, is I know a lot of people all over the world because I had, a, <laughs> I think I had the most teammates of anybody that, you know, you're year welcome year, everywhere. You're... Oh man, I got, I was like, I know him. I know him. I know that coach. I remember that yeah. coach or he was a water boy. Now he's the head coach here. Like, you know what I mean? It's, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. yeah, that is, that is cool. That is cool to have, to have a, a open door everywhere you go because it's just, it's, that's the business. That's the yeah. business at the end of the day. Yeah. For um, sure. All right. This is this this was the pro ball segment, uh, but the the story you're gonna have to tell is about Venezuela. What you saw was this the this, I I haven't heard that before. Where players, I mean, you have to fear for your life, honestly. Yeah. Not like I, honestly, like I'm gonna tell you, my first. 24 hours in Venezuela. I actually did a YouTube video about it. <laughs> it's funny, but uh, my first 24 hours. So like I get the, uh, I, I get, you know, I'm talking to my agent, whatever it is, we work the deal out. I'm going to Venezuela after the season. I'm like, cool. I'm about to make some money finally. So I get on the plane. I go from LA to Atlanta. My flight's delayed leaving Atlanta to go to Caracas. And then uh, it's like two hours delayed. Then finally we fly out, get to Caracas. So like back then, this is 2011 or whatever. I don't have, my phone doesn't work when I'm overseas or nothing like that. So we land, my bag is late while I'm waiting for my bag. People coming up to me like, Oh, uh, you play basketball? Like, yeah. Like, Oh, okay. You American. I'm like, yeah. They're like, I right, look, Venezuela, very dangerous, you know, second most dangerous country in the world. Be careful. Like, okay. Somebody else come up to me. You play basketball? Like, yeah. They're like, Hey, be careful. Venezuela, the second most dangerous country in the world. So I'm like, yo, where am I at? <laughs> the only thing I did was like a Wikipedia search. Like, you know what I mean? Before that, I thought Venezuela was in Africa somewhere. Yeah. So I'm talking to the lady. Lady don't know where my bag's at. The lady with Delta, she don't know where my bag's at. I'm trying to like look over to the family friend section. I don't see nobody with, you know, a polo or nothing on from the team so i'm just like man so finally somebody radios back and they're like all right look your bag is delayed they're gonna they're gonna send it to you tomorrow your driver's on the other side his name is angel right i'm like all right cool so i go to the other side i don't see nobody with a polo i just see this dude he chilling on the rail he see me he like yo 
I'm like, what's up, man? He's like, yo, you play for Trotter Mundo? So I'm like, yeah. He's like, all right, look, I'm going to take you to a hotel tonight. You're going to pay for the hotel. And then tomorrow we're going to drive to Valencia because it's a three-hour drive. And then uh, the team's going to reimburse you for everything. He's like, all right. I'm like, all right, cool. He just starts walking away. I'm like, hey, bro. I'm like, what's your name? He's like, Angel. I'm like, cool. So we get outside. We get to the car. He's not even driving. His homeboy driving. Oh so like God. now I'm like, all right, hold up. So I get it. Keep in mind, like everybody's been telling me it's the most dangerous city, <laughs> most dangerous country in the world. I get in the back seat. I don't even take my backpack off. I get in the back seat with it on like this, right? I'm making sure the door is unlocked, like everything. Cause like <laughs> when you go in Venezuela, it all looks like hood. So at least the areas we were driving in. So I'm just like, yo, if they try to pull into a parking garage, anything, like I'm jumping out the back seat. Like I don't care. So I get there. Uh, get to the hotel, get the hotel room, go to sleep, wake up in the morning. Same dudes. He's he's downstairs with the same outfit on from yesterday. And then a different homeboy come picks us up. So long story short, we get to the basketball office and uh, the GM's not there. They call the GM. He's like, Anthony, you here? I'm like, yeah. He's like, how you get here? I'm like, Angel brought me. He's like, nah, how'd you get here? I'm like, Angel brought me. He's like, nah. I'm like, I'm staring at Angel right now, bro. He's like, nah, I don't know what's going on, but we'll talk about it later. Hangs up the phone. So now I'm like looking at this dude like, yo, who is this? Like, what is going on? Right? Like, I'm like in the twilight zone. Um, So I go, we got practice later that night. I don't even get dressed. I go straight to the gym. I'm like, yo, bro, what happened? He's like, listen, I don't know if that guy's name was Angel by coincidence, but our driver Angel left because your flight and everything was so delayed. We didn't know where you were. We were calling to the States. You know, you could have been kidnapped, if not worse. And I was just like, yo, so I guess he, the guy just heard them looking for somebody for, for a basketball player. And he was just like, yeah, I'll take him. And uh, just did it so he could get paid, you know, but yeah. like, I literally got, I got taken three hours away in a car with strangers and oh like, you know, kind of like the kidnap capital of, uh, of South America, man. And uh, it was a, it was a crazy time, man. I had teammates that got robbed at gunpoint by a couple 13 year olds. Uh, we seen a knife fight in the stands. Like the fans would like flash their guns on you, and like none of the uh, police in the stands had guns. They just had shields and stuff. They, but it like honestly, I say all that, but I also say that, like it's dangerous in regards to how you move and stuff like that. But like the people there are super nice, super fun. Like they, it was like the best basketball atmosphere I played in from like a fun standpoint, because if things are going really good for the home team or really bad for the home team, they're throwing beers on the court and then they got to clean it up. <laughs> like, you know, things going well, they turn the music up, everybody's dancing. Like it's a, uh, it was a crazy environment, man. It was uh it's funny. I was just talking to somebody the other day about Venezuela, man, but I got some good memories out there, but it, it was just, it was just sad to see like just how, how dangerous it was, um, especially at night and how you, you know, you just had to move uh, safely, but it was uh, for sure, man. Like the, the people were great, still got friends from out there and uh, the experience of playing basketball out there was, was really fun. Yeah. It's man. Luckily you got good stories to tell. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's a dangerous encounter there. Yeah. You know, you don't know how it could have ended up. No, nah, no, nah, for sure. Yeah. And I, it was, it was crazy, but I remember Justin Dittman was out there when I was there. He got robbed um, in his apartment. Somebody wow. broke into his apartment and stole like his PlayStation and some other stuff. Like you would hear like a bunch of stories back then. I've heard the situation has gotten a lot better out there now. And then the second time I went back, it was like even worse in regards to like scarcity. Like there weren't, you go to the grocery store, you wouldn't find rice. There'd be no milk. There'd be yeah. no this. Like you could literally probably just buy a pack of chicken and then we'd have to call our owner like, oh, I need rice. I need pasta. I need this and that. And then obviously he's connected. He would have somebody bring it. You just pay him the next day. So, um, yeah, it, it was sad, man, to see it uh, like around 2015. I think I went back 2016. I went back um, for a month. But yeah, it was it was crazy. But I heard it's I heard it's bounced back, which is which is good to hear. Did you have going from country to country to all these European countries that you went to to play? Did you have a certain approach or mindset going into the country, or just kind of open open to new experiences? You know, because I know I've seen, and the first encounter in Germany when I was their assistant coach, I know I remember I was the one picking up guys from the airport because I was most fluent in English, and it was kind of mm -hmm. easy way in into a new country, into a new place because we got we used to get rookies, you know, so a rookie mm -hmm. comes over. 
you're gonna have them you're gonna have to give them a soft landing you know having like a little comfortable approach and then you go to the apartment the the refrigerator is full of food just kind of ease ease into the situation pick them up to the practice and kind of learn learn the learn the tricks and traits of being being overseas but did you did you have any early adaptation issues or did you have an early, like a, an easy adaptation when you because you were open to culture because Kyle Hines also said how, how he was just kind of talking to Jerome Allen Jerome just told mm. him like look man this is this is just be open to new new new, new a different way of living and and it's going to be much easier of having an open mindset and not be closed off and introvert go out talk to people and just kind of be open to new to the to the uh community that you're in yeah i, I mean i think that having venezuela as a first stop really opened my eyes to a lot of things like I learned like I can't I'm not going to sit here and complain about everything, you know, at least I can yeah. walk down the street or, you know, do different things like so by the time I got to Italy and Ukraine and, you know, Israel was a breeze. I mean, Tel Aviv yeah. who wouldn't want to live there. But, um, you know, by the time I got to other countries, uh, I was I was open to just adjusting. But I mean, I will I do remember my first day in a, in Italy. I went to the grocery store and um you know, it's my first day. I didn't have anything in my fridge. So like, I'm trying to fill it all out. So the lady's scanning, 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 like, you know, 200 euros worth of groceries. You know, in the States, they bag our groceries. Yeah. So I'm just sitting there. I'm staring at her. She's looking at me. And I'm like, uh, <laughs> what's the problem here? And then she holds up a bag like, yo, you need a bag? And I'm like, oh, and I started looking around like we got to bag our own joint. So... <laughs> I'm like trying to rush and I know everybody behind me is like, yo, what is wrong with this dude? But uh, I'll never forget that. That was like the, uh, that was my welcome to Europe moment. I was like, okay, I need to, I need to start paying attention. But uh, I think I like to think of myself as a very attentive person. You know what I mean? I, I always, you know, when in Rome, I try to, yeah. you know, I try to see what everybody else is doing and make sure I'm doing things right. Like, even if I'm eating food, like I kind of like look around like, yo, how I eat this, you know, try to see if anybody yeah, else yeah, eat yeah. the right way. So, um, you know, uh, it's just one of those things, but I invite, you know, kind of the, uh, the novelty of living in different places now, nowadays. And I never really had a problem with it. I had a problem with service. So like in Europe, yeah. You need your Wi-Fi cut on. You need something fixed or whatever. It is so slow. Like that used to kill me. Like don't have me in here without Wi-Fi or heat or AC or whatever it is. You know what I mean? Like that used to kill me because it used to take days and days and days just to get stuff done. And uh, that part I did not like and I was not willing to adjust. I was very yeah. frustrated with that, but everything else is cool. Yeah, those things are usually out of the club's control, but that's also on them to do it earlier. You know, just mm -hmm. to have have that set up already when the, when the player arrives because they know the apartment. I, mean, I don't know. It's every club, every country is different too, so I I can't I can't have a you know right right exactly. the whole hub. So it's about in Spain. It took me three months to get my internet. <laughs> it took me it took me forever. By the time they called me, I was like, I'm out. I'm I'm done. I'm I'm going back to to uh, to. I was at that time. I went back to Lithuania, but I was yes. I was heated. Yeah, that's the worst, bro. It's the that's worst. A, and the internet. Internet's like air these days. <laughs> yeah, back then I was I I didn't have it, so I had to go to this cafe. I was I was in Gava outside of Barcelona. I had to go to this cafe to download to download my games. And uh, the guy there, I was trying to be nice too. I was trying to talk a little bit in Spanish, and that's about you know, it's you you better if I if I I could have impressed if I learned Catalan maybe, and yeah. he he was not having it at all. He did, never cracked a smile. He saw just me there with a the laptop and drinking my cortado, and he didn't let, allow me to charge my laptop while I was working. So by the mm. time I down I had to download the games because by the time the battery drained, I had to go home, mm -hmm. charge my battery. They had siesta. Then I come back in the afternoon. Hey, I'm back again. Hey, yeah, good. Yeah. <laughs> like I, I, I would, that's that was my lifestyle in Gava, just downloading games at the cafe with an angry uh, barista. That's um, tough. What's what's um going into retirement or approaching retirement, and then going out of out of the basketball identity, the basketball player identity? Was there certain behaviors after being? or playing basketball for 15 years, including Stanford. So mm -hmm. like, was there certain behaviors you had to unlearn? Is there something that like, a mind shift had to occur for you to get used to a normal life or a normal, normal person's life and have a, uh, 
realizing that you have to have a different approach with people maybe, or is, is there something that you had to unlearn in terms of holding, controlling your emotions better? Because on the court, we're, we allow to let our emotions go a lot of times, you know? So there's some kind of restraint when you get off the court, then you, is there, was there some sort of behaviors you had to unlearn and, and restructure your, your lifestyle? Yeah. Food portion. Food portions was the first thing I had to unlearn because mm -hmm. it's you quickly you quickly forget that like when when basketball is your job every day you're running on the court at least two hours a day sometimes four hours a day that's like essentially working out sweating burning calories eat whatever you want you're fine right um, so when I retired and I'm back home I'm you know going on a little jog for like an hour you know and doing my push ups and stuff and. I was still eating the same, but so I started putting on weight and I'm just like, man, I'm working out every day. Like what's going on. And then I started to realize like, I can't eat the same way that, you know, either I got to eat less or I got to work out more. And, um, so I had to find that balance. Um, because as an athlete, you know, you get used to seeing yourself a certain way. You get used to seeing your body a certain way. And then, you know, I'm doing switch cultures and, you know, I'm in the gym with all these players and stuff. And like, you see them and they're in shape and they're working out every day, just kind of like you were just doing, you know what I'm saying? So then you kind of get like a complex, like, yo, like, nah, like I'm not that far removed. Like I should still be in shape. So that was a, uh, that was one thing for me, but I think retiring in general, and as I've talked to other athletes that are in the process of transitioning or have already transitioned, um, I always say nothing's going to replace that feeling of playing. Like, just mm -hmm. forget it. <laughs> like, you're never going to replace that feeling. You know what I'm saying? Go get in the men's league. Go do what you got to do. You're never going to replace that feeling, though. Um, so don't look for a job that's going to replace that feeling. Like, you know, look for a job that, you know, A, is centered around something you love and you have some form of passion behind it. And then, um, you know, just try to pick up the pieces to get as close to that feeling as possible, but you're never going to reach it. And you got to be okay with that. And that's the part, the tough part is just feeling like, okay, I'm going to be okay with that. You know? So I think that, uh, yeah, man, it's, it's extremely difficult, man. And a lot of people, I always thought like the day I retired, I'm going to cry. I'm going to lock myself in the house. The day I decide like I'm done. I'm going to lock myself in the room. I'm not going to talk to nobody. It's going to be an emotional day, all this other stuff. And like, it wasn't. And I never really had that like emotional moment. Like, dang, like it's really, I didn't really realize it was over until I went to go, uh, I went to go scout a practice and I saw the guys, like the players, you know, joking around during stretching and, you know, talking trash to each other. Like, that's when I missed it. I missed the yeah. locker room. I missed the camaraderie. That's when I was like, dang, I'm really on the other side. Like I'm sitting in the bleachers, like, you know, and I was just like, dang, it's really over. But um, yeah, outside of that, I mean, every now and then, you know, you get flashes like, man, I wish I was still playing or you see like a friend. Like I just talked to my friend, one of my old teammates yesterday, he's 39 and still hooping. And mm -hmm. I was just like, dang, man, like that's, it's a beautiful thing, especially our generation is playing longer and longer at a higher level. Yep. Um, you know, because of the modalities and everything else that's, uh, that's surrounded recovery in the last 10 to 15 years. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, but you know, you start your second life, they say athlete dies two, lives two lives, you know, lives two death has two deaths, you know, one when he uh, retires and then one when he dies, but, um, you know, just finding your second career. And I think the good, the, the cool part is once you get into your second career, you're not as emotionally attached to it. So I feel like it's easier to kind of stay flexible and be open to new things and learning new things and, and stuff like that, because uh, yeah, because it's, it's a fresh start, but you got to be a rookie again. Uh, I totally agree with you that, that part that there's nothing that's going to be re re replacing those emotions on the court. Um, I real I, I had two, chapters a player chapter and a coaching chapter which i still can enjoy with the national team mm -hmm. and the emotional part you, you it's not it's unreplaceable even as a, on the coaching staff like you, you can't replace that what you experience on the court because of mm -hmm. that the involvement the adrenaline the physicality the, everything that you kind of went through the battles the physical battles and you overcome those and the victory that you 
that you feel inside of you with your peers, it's 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 something that's second to none. And mm -hmm. and uh, the adrenaline rush, it's kind of I mean you you get dependent on the hormonally. I mean, I, I'm not mm -hmm. trying to get scientifically scientific scientific here, but it's it is it is hormonal. So yeah. there is a lot of guys that struggle with that. Uh, when they don't have the perspective to really change their mind in terms of having a different approach and put that to the side because that was a whole different realm. You're not gonna that's 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 something that you can't find in regular life. And finding a passion, finding a new passion. And once I got also also out of that 24-7 coaches bubble where I was in the video room and bunker all the time, I went and did this job. This job exposed me to a whole lot of different new facets of life and and, mm -hmm. and that is what's in, intriguing then you also have to make sure that you kind of can dial it back at some point and fo refocus on your job because there's so many more interesting things out there that i want to absorb that i want to learn that you when we were hanging out in senegal and went to one of our trips it's just kind of like you said you see content everywhere and that's what uh, we, mm -hmm. we transitioning to into switch cultures and into just podcasting into different different uh, hobbies that become become a passion that become mm -hmm. also another part another another uh job that you have on the side which is also you know it's it's where your 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 emotions are attached to you because you mm -hmm. found you find content you you realize that this is interesting this is the creative part of you because some some part of our regular jobs is not as creative it's just uh, uh, observing evaluating and the other part is where you can creatively express yourself so yeah. i'm i'm wondering first of all how how you go about with with swish cultures with two podcasts right you have to, you have mm -hmm. two podcasts going at the same time mm -hmm. you have a youtube channel there's there's a lot of things that you have to structure in your hand you have to have the bandwidth but if you have the passion i think the bandwidth automatically is going to be expanded anyways so yeah. how how do you how how do you deal with those different different parts of your of your uh, creative life, and how do you combine those those different parts at the same time while not losing focus on the main thing or uh, in, in your job? Yeah, I mean, I think that the uh, I mean the creative side, like this is this is essentially like watching TV for me, and I think like switch culture yeah. is kind of it kind of aligns with, you know, everything else I'm doing. I mean, my life is centered around basketball. So it's like, if I'm watching a game, I'm watching TJ shorts last night, you know, yeah. I'm watching the game for whatever reason. Um, I could sit there and be like, Oh man, he had a couple nice plays. I can put that up on switch cultures tomorrow. Like, you know, and that just makes it that much easier for me. I don't have to skim through a hundred box scores and see who might've had a good game and look through their mm -hmm. clips and all that other stuff, you know saying? So, um yeah man i think there's uh the creative side i mean i've just always been a creative in general so uh, i always need to do something creative i don't care if it's sketching writing rapping whatever it is like you know what i mean um I, I just like to create and just that's my fun that's my tv i don't watch tv so it's yeah. like me neither anything I, yeah. we're like we're like the same i'm not i don't watch tv <laughs> i don't watch tv man so it's like because i feel like when I watch TV, I'm sitting down and I'm watching somebody else's creation. It's yes. not like I watch it for like inspiration and somebody's like, oh, this was dope or this was good or whatever it is. I watch it then. Um, but it's like, uh, you know, I'd rather not just watch it. So I'd rather create, you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, man, I, I think the, uh, the creation part is key because I think, too, like when you're scouting, like you don't really have a lot of impact. You know what I mean? You don't have a lot of impact that you can control. Like you, you, you're very much, your, your job is essentially kind of black and white. There's not like a lot of room for creativity. You can't make this guy make eight shots when he made six or, you know what I mean? Whatever it is, you could give your opinion. And I think that's where the lines of your creativity are, uh, you know, are, are drawn, but you know, it's not, it's not very like impactful. Like, okay, if I write this about, you know, somebody, my opinion here is going to change the entire season or whatever, you know what I mean? But I think that, um, you know, when you create or, you know, you like you had the podcast with Boris Diaw and he tells you something crazy that you've never heard before. Like that's dope. And then the whole basketball world sees it and like, what? no way. You know what I mean? It's like, 
that was that crazy, was man. That was impactful, <laughs> though. That's impactful. Like, yeah. and it's like, had you not had the podcast or whatever it is, like, who knows when we would have heard this story or if we would have even heard it in English or, you know what I mean? There's just so many yep. what ifs. So, you know, that's where I say that, like, uh, I think the, I think coupling, uh, our job with the creative side, I think is, is really cool because, you know, we're blessed in the sense that we get to go to a lot of different places and meet a lot of different people from different cultures and pretty much just comb through the entire basketball world. You know what I mean? From agents to front office, to coaches, to players, like all that, you know what I mean? We really get to take it all in. And, um, and then, you know, we use our creative juices to kind of, you know, you know, fish that out to the world. So, uh, you know, I, I think there's there, there's a lot to love about, you know, combining the creative with, you know, your day job, but it does does take a lot of time. And then sometimes depending on, you know, your bandwidth, sometimes you do get on E like last night I was on E, you mm -hmm. know, I was tired by the end of the day. I had so many calls and stuff by the end of the day. I was cooked. But, yeah. uh, you know, you get your rest in the next day is the next day. And that's when sleep comes in, my man. Mm -hmm. You gotta, you gotta get that sleep ride too, man. Nah, for sure. I mean, yeah, you definitely, you definitely got to do that. You definitely got to sleep, man. I think people underrate sleep, but uh, yeah, I got sleep apps and everything. I try to get like hypnotized so I can sleep. <laughs> you know, so I can't do it on my own. Let me, let me ask you this about about the the because there's a lot of drive that we have not naturally also as former athletes as as uh well, if you're if you were in a sports professional sports environment you naturally are driven so that also translates into what you do with the creative part with switch cultures with that with the podcast with everything you have a drive right we all have like a sense of um accomplishment that we want to achieve that there's something there how much is that sense of accomplishment that you drive for and you strive for versus stress and something a fear of failure within it is there is there a competition within the competition for you or are you just naturally is that come to you easily when you watch it you see you see the the content that you can create and you don't really stress yourself out for it or is that something that you use as motivation to drive the brand even further up yeah i mean i think <clears throat> i think when you look at the landscape and you see um you know other things that people are doing you know, remarkably, uh, you do want to kind of create something on that level. I've always, it's funny because now that I'm doing what I'm doing, I remember as a kid, I used to love commercials. If you asked me what I wanted to be, probably when I was around like 11 years old, I was like, I want to make commercials. I used to get so excited for the Super Bowl just for the commercials because <laughs> I was just like, yo, it's like, it's like a 30 minute movie or a 30 or a 30 second movie or a 30 second joke. Like, you know what I mean? And I thought it was so cool. And, um, and, you know, I saw a look at this commercial, like, Oh, that didn't move me or that was a really good one or whatever. Um, and then I kind of lost that thought. And, you know, once I got into media, my thing was, is especially in Europe, I was just like, I'm so sick of having to answer. Oh, I want to be the first one in the last one out, or, uh, I, I care about the team. I, I got tired of answering like that. And I got tired of hearing other people answer the same way. Like I, I got sick of watching the interview and then you're like, okay, you know exactly what he's going to say. Oh, it's not about me. It's about the team. It's like, nah, yeah, yeah. I had 20 points. They could not guard me tonight. <laughs> and I hope I can do it again tomorrow. Like, you know what I mean? I hope they watch these highlights. To, like, that's what yeah. I really want to say, but you know, yeah. okay. I'm going to put the the athlete hat on and be humble. Like, no, nah, that's not what we're saying in the locker room. No. You know what I'm saying? So why we got to say this now? And that's where it's like, I look at switch cultures and, you know, anybody can argue with me if they want, but I feel like, you know, we, we speak the language of the locker room, you know what I mean? In, in mm -hmm. regards to media companies and, uh, and, and partly because, you know, I played and, you know, my partner played and, other part partner was an athlete as well. So it's just like, I feel like we are like the voice of the locker room in a, in a sense, um, in regards to media companies. Cause you know, I, I'm just, I'm just sick. I was sick of like the cookie cutter media stuff. And, yeah. uh, you know, I just wanted to kind of do something different. So, and I'm glad because I feel like we are, and I think that's why we have our own little cult following and, um, yeah, and we put out unique content that, uh, that we don't see, but yeah.
It ain't it ain't a little following. <laughs> You're being humble. <laughs> nah, it ain't a little it, following. It's funny because I've always said that, like, you know, my partners. Uh, I felt like I felt like sometimes in some of our conversations, I always felt like they think we're bigger than we are. I think we're smaller than we are, and the truth is in the middle. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And I think that the reason that is is because they're in LA and they're around a whole bunch of creatives. You know, the creative network in LA is huge, and like they're around people that recognize the content and stuff like that. Whereas we're not as big in Europe. So I go out, mm. nobody's going to recognize me or anything like mm. that. Sometimes I get recognized in the States and, you know, especially if I got like a Swiss shirt on or something, but um, you know, so it's like, I think because of that, like my mentality is still very much like it was when I was in France and I put the first two videos up, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's just yeah. like, we have zero followers. Like <laughs> how are we going to get to 10 followers, you know? So it's like, it, it's, it's beautiful to see what we've grown to, but, um, and we've never paid for followers. We never like, you know, did any of that stuff. Uh, we, we grew organically and, uh, and I think that was the right way to go about things. And, uh, you know, I'm very proud of, uh, of where we are and, uh, and, uh, and I'm excited to see, you know, what could be, you know, the next step for us. Yeah, no, it's 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 orga as organic as it gets, and you see that the, the following is as organic because everybody's on there. That's it's our basketball fanatics, you know, and mm -hmm. that's that's what it's supposed. That's what it's for. What mm -hmm. before we go into the ATOs because we're we're winding up here. But mm -hmm. what was the first seed for for Swiss Cultures? Where where did that originally come? How did it come about? Well, who who planted yeah. the first seed? Yeah, so. Uh... So my, my partner, Jordan, uh, who we played together in Dominican Republic. So before Switch Cultures, I had a podcast that I was doing, right? Um, and then he was like, he was putting up his own highlights from like, he was working out and stuff and filming himself and putting up highlights. And I thought it was corny at the time because nobody was doing it at the time. So like uh, it was preseason that season in 20, 2017. He called me. He's like, hey, bro, we should do uh, highlights for overseas basketball players. I was like, yeah, it's a good idea. He was like, uh, cause I, he was like, you, you know how to edit. I was like, not really, but I figured it out. And then that day, man, I just got on YouTube, downloaded the program, and the first two videos went up. It was uh Charles Cahooty and uh Eloy Vargas uh in France. <laughs> they yeah. they played against each other. Those are the first two Swish videos ever. I think Eloy might have been first. Um, but those are the first two Swish videos ever. Um, so that is cool. Yeah, it started back then, and then you know we just uh, we just moved on from there. Charles still yeah. playing though, man. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah, he is. He is. <laughs> so if, Yo, I if, had a question for you though, man. Shoot. So, so if there was, let's just say that there was a player, and he's thinking about, he's thinking about, okay, I'm either gonna go into scouting or coaching. I haven't been on both sides. How would you direct somebody to go to one side or the other? That's a very good question. Um, I think if early early on, I think you you should maximize if you are if you want to stay close to the court, you want to stay close to the locker room, you want to have people around you, and you are more of a social person that that needs that uh, team environment you should stick with with coaching for a little bit longer just to stick around and stick around the game and give give your information pass that information along to the staff that you want that you experience uh, as a player and you know you'll you'll find out if you want to coach or not along the way i think that's it's it's easier to transition from coaching into scouting off the court and then go into that realm and then be maybe uh, transition back into management than it is to go out and be out of the team environment, be in scouting, and then just kind of go back into coaching. It's a completely, it's it's a it's a it's a tougher transition, I think. Mm -hmm. So, as a player, if you are finishing up, I would suggest to, if you can't decide between the two, because there's other options out there too. But if you can't decide between the two, I I would suggest to stick around the team a little bit longer and be in a coaching staff and be around and have feel if you really are wanting to do, doing if you want to do the video work if you want to be in in around the staff and you want to because it's a different it's a different regime than it is for a player so not all mm -hmm. players are in tune and, and and want to have that office time all the time you have to have a lot of meetings with the coaching staff you got to go through a lot of different situations you have to be absolutely passionate about the topics the pick and roll defense is going to be number one discussion if you get tired of talking about the pick and roll defense after two weeks that might not be for you so you mm -hmm. gotta this you gotta go through that experience it and know if you have to 
the the passion, the energy for it, and to go through that ten months of a year. Uh, because mm -hmm. you know, if you're not doing national team, you're gonna have ten months of that completely dialed in intensity, and it's a different level of intensity than it is. But players have a different level. I'm not saying either one is bigger, but it's a different different kind of intensity. And then you have to have learned the understanding for what the head coach is going through. Uh, I've never been a head coach before, but as an assistant coach, you kind of feel the tension, the pressure that he's going through, and then it's interesting and you can be a providing helping hand to kind of calm the waters a little bit within the locker room. And that's, there's a lot more dynamics within the coach's locker room and within, within the locker room in itself, being close to the team because mm -hmm. as a contrary to the scouting side and the scouting side, you kind of come in, you observe, you're in a stance, like you said earlier, you, you evaluate, you get information, you talk to the coaches on a very casual basis. And it also depends on the day they're having. And then you're out, you know, you're doing your own thing. You kind of, you, you, you're, you're completely away from that bubble. That's a completely different bubble you're living in. And it's hard to transition from, from the scouting bubble to the coach's bubble and vice versa. I think that's, that's the feel I have doing that. And, and I'm lucky to be able to do both because then the transition becomes easier, but I felt it mm -hmm. when I, when I, when there was a longer break. Now we have the window. So it's, it's a little bit easier to go you know, from scouting to coaching after a year of just, just scouting around and, and traveling. And, you know, it was, it was also tough. I've got some players when they retire. It's also tough when I went out of the coaching, full-time coaching into scouting, full-time scouting. And then you kind of seeing your guys on TV, like you, you went through the battles with them. You see them uh, like, I, what am I doing here? You know, I'm completely yeah, out yeah. of it. Like that's, that's, I'm not, I'm supposed to be right there. So it, it took a little while to, to transition. And that was, that was the tougher part, but that's why I would suggest for players to stick around a little bit longer and kind of figure out if you really, if you having to say no, is also important. Like knowing when to say no, uh, feeling mm -hmm. that you really chuck that, that put that check mark on there. I tried it and it's, it's not going to be for me. So, and then you can move on. That's interesting. That's a good point. That's a really good point. Um, so you ready for my ATOs? You Let's almost get it. Let's you, get you, it. you almost survived my whole podcast here. So, <laughs> uh, um, so all right, quick, quick, come and go here. Funniest follow on Twitter or X or whatever you want to call it. Funniest follow, um, man, it's funny. I I go to Twitter, man, just for uh, oh, Mike Hall, Mike Hall, Mike for Hall. Sure. Okay, yeah, Mike Hall for sure. He's he's crazy. He's He's wild. He was a former teammate of mine. But uh, if you're not following Mike Hall, I don't even know what his handle is, like Michael Lino or something like that. But Mike is, uh, I think he's trying to like climb up the coaching ranks. So he's tweeting less, which is good for him because his mouth <laughs> will get him in trouble. But uh, Mike, Mike by far. All sure. right. What tabs are open in your browser right now? What's what? Tabs. What tabs are open in your browser? Oh man, uh, Google downloading YouTube videos, uh, <laughs> Google again, <laughs> it's my email, Google search and like downloading YouTube videos. Cause I'm a pirate. <laughs> um, as you see, I updated my ATO question. So I'm, 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 I'm putting people more on the spot here. All right. Um, in, in a room with any, in a room with anyone you ever met, who would you look for? Uh, I probably look for, I probably look for, I probably look for my dad, you know, my dad passed when I was 12 and I feel like there's, uh, there would just be a lot of questions, especially as an adult, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I felt like I missed that part of the relationship. And I think that, yeah, he'd probably be the first person I look for. And then my mom, but you know, I talk to my mom every day. We could talk another day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, box of everything you've ever lost. What is the first thing you look for? Man, my passport. <laughs> then I wouldn't have had to fly to Miami. <laughs> nah, uh, man, everything I ever lost, man. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I never really, I never really had, I had a crazy situation where I lost my house in uh, Corona. Um, and I'm not going to get into the details of how it happened because it wasn't my fault, but uh, I felt like that was so devastating to me because that was like the one thing I had from my playing career that like, okay, this was what all the running, all the, all the everything, you know, all the everything I went through, I felt like this was 
symbolic of that. You know what I'm saying? And um, yeah, finding out that uh, everything had transpired the way it did and just the mess with the lawyers and all that other stuff like that was like, it was tough to get over. But I felt like that was like the one thing where I was just like, damn, like, and on the bright side, bought another house in August uh, this past year. So, you know, it's kind of kind of like getting my backpack stolen and getting a new camera and getting a new <laughs> iPhone and passport. Like, you know, you, you know, you're going to replace things that you lose, but it's always the things that are symbolic. So like, even when I lost my backpack a couple of weeks ago, like I, the thing that emotionally I was tied to the most was uh, I had like a, a, a rose gold chain in there. And that was like, I was never really into jewelry um, that much but like that was something recently um, that I had bought like a couple years ago that I was like all right I'm because I never really buy myself anything I was like, I'm gonna buy this for myself so mm -hmm. it was like the chain in the house were like two things that like I bought that I was just uh I had some emotional attachment to and so like losing those two things were kind of like uh probably a little more you know uh tougher to get over than uh than everything else but I bet usually I'm, I'm kind of cool with things Lost. I bet. Yeah, it's, uh, it sounds like an emotional, emotional experience there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. ch chance to re chance to relive, relive one day of your life. Which day would that be? A whole day. A whole day. Man, chance to live a whole day. Relive. Um, yeah, relive a whole day. You know, I I think. I think it will be the day that I got into Stanford, um, mm. that I got the acceptance letter and I didn't care today. I'm very nonchalant, like happy go. Like I got in, I was like, Oh, cool. My mom obviously was super excited. And I, I look, I look back at that moment is probably, you know, the most precious moment in my life that obviously I didn't realize it back then, but like for her, like having to raise me by myself for, or by herself, for most of those years, take me to practices, make sure I do my homework, all that other stuff. And then, you know, she came from the South and, you know, obviously segregation and, you know, she had to walk through the back of, you know, walk through the back of buildings and blacks weren't allowed to eat vanilla ice cream, just like all this stuff that she had to go through and just keeping a black kid alive. And then for him to get into Stanford, I know she was just, you know, head above the clouds and i wish i could relive that day to really take that moment in mm -hmm. and enjoy it with her because i know when she told me she gave me a hug and a kiss i'm like all right mom get off me like you know and went back to you know watching the laker game or something but yeah you know uh i wish i would have uh took that moment in a little more because i know it was probably uh special for her that is that is cool for you to realize that to reflect on that because of everything mm -hmm. everything i mean I sense I I can sense that's a really big importance to your mom, and that that's mm -hmm. something. It's it's really it's really cool. That you can reflect on that and remember that, and and put all those things into words, and then put it into perspective. Yeah, you know, as you get older, you just see things that that happen, whether it be sacrifices from your parents or a teacher or whatever it is. You start seeing like the little things that were so much more important than you even had a clue back then. Yeah, you know yeah. What I'm saying. And uh, so, you know, in retrospect, man, uh, you know, I, I think there's everybody has a couple of those moments, you know. And some people don't don't mature to that point where they can reflect upon that and see, you know, mm -hmm. kind of admit to certain things that they should have done different. And that's when, the you know, they don't grow. That's that's the bottom yeah. line of it. Yeah, that's a fact. So the last last one, uh, top three things, events or or uh, experiences left on your bucket list uh experiences left on my bucket list man uh i really i want to go to brazil but i'm going for bwb brazil's just always been on my bucket list i don't know why um uh i'll say that's one uh i think another two would be Man, I really don't know. I think anything I really want to do. Okay, so I've been working on. <laughs> I've been working on a, uh, a animation series for years uh, about like the craziest stories that have happened to professional athletes, 
and I've been, I, I mean, I've literally been working on this thing probably about seven, eight years now. Wow. And if that thing ever makes the light of day, and I'm talking about like on a big streaming channel or something like that, that will be a, a bucket list moment for me. And um, yeah, and I think like the last thing for me would just be to do something um, do something else impactful in the basketball world. You know what I mean? I felt like Swish Cultures was, you know, nobody was really doing highlights of players. It was always team oriented. And now, you know, there's multiple channels and pages and stuff like showcasing other overseas highlights for basketball players. So I felt like, you know, we were the first in that lane and we kind of started that wave and made it cool. And now other people are starting to do that. And I'm glad like we left our stamp on that. And, um, you know, I, I really want to do something else. I'm not sure what that is, but I really want to do something else that's going to make the basketball world better um, and more inclusive, you know, both sides, America and, you know, overseas. So I don't know what that is yet, but uh, yeah, that, that would be another bucket list thing. I'm not done creating. So I got to I got to create one more thing. I wish y'all the best. I wish y'all the best. If you need if you need help with creation, let me know. I'm I'm I I got some I got some ideas too. Nah, for sure, man. You know I me. Mean? I'll just fire up. I'll bring the coffee beans. You know what I mean? We'll just sit down and hammer it out. I, that's that's another creation of mine that's gonna come up. Uh, Benos on beans. That's gonna there be that, that's gonna be the coffee channel. Benos on beans because the autocorrect for 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 Benos is beans. <laughs> oh, that's real. Okay, I like it. I like it. That's creative. That's creative. Yeah. Yo, I, real quick, I saw a, uh, I saw Kenny Smith. Uh, he said in like an interview that he was sleeping on the plane next to this lady, and this lady was like, "Look, don't sleep on the plane because yeah, of yeah, accident." Actually, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. You saw that, right? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. when you're your most creative. Do you believe that? No. No, I don't. I don't really. I sometimes the the air pressure gets to me, and then I'm I'm uh, I get tired, and I, I I take a nap. I I just I think it's 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 the moment. It's a moment thing. I don't think that that's that's something that's can scientifically be proven. That that's when the you know the the creation aligns and the 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 the, the neurons start firing. And I feel like creation is a spur of the moment. Like sometimes you you get the most inspiring and the most the best ideas in the stillest moments and in the shower on the mm -hmm. toilet and when on a train when yep. you don't have music on you just kind of in your own zone and not doing doing nothing that's when something happens and that's when so that's when your brain cells are not distracted that's when you're 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 mostly in tune with yourself and i think that's when the most ideas come along i don't think that a plane or the air pressure or like uh, if you want to sleep, you sleep, man. That might it's gonna give you some rest, and that might inspire you to. That might give you some energy. That's a power nap that you might need for that moment. So, I I don't feel like that's. I don't feel like that's true. I mean, you got to. She got to show me some like hundred studies that yeah. prove that. But I mean, there there are less stimulants on an airplane than like. The, in... Yeah. The, so so it depends what you do. Then. Yeah, there is less stimulants, but there is there is then you don't have you don't have your 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 AirPods on or whatever because mm -hmm. then I just automatically revert to working, and that's it's obviously yeah. you're on a plane, and then you kind of you can get stuff done. Uh, but yeah, there is still there's if you just take out the AirPods, you don't you don't look at the the the, the iPad, uh, and you just kind of let your 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 thoughts flow then yeah maybe something is going to come along but that you can do the same thing in a train and an uber ride true, you can true, it, true, there's true. there is it's not train it's not plain specific you know like there, there has to be some chemical reaction just because you're in that high of an altitude so that i don't know if that can be correlated i don't know i gotta do some searching i'll let you know, <laughs> I'll let you know. <laughs> How can people find you? Let it, let let everyone know how they can find you. Swish Cultures, obviously, Swish Cultures. Yeah, Swish Cultures at swishcultures.com. Uh, I'm on Instagram at, at antgoods, A-N-T goods 87. And then uh, Twitter is just at antgoods. So right. that's where I'm at, man. And uh, yeah, I, I need to get a website and stuff, you know, start start keeping everything on one little hub so I can just be like, go to here.com, you know what I mean? Yeah. But, yeah, I need to. That's gonna be my next project. Check out, check out my website, and uh, maybe you get some inspiration there. I got a pod map on there. Okay. Uh, right. where, 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 where should I pin you on that pod map? I'm in Which, Madrid. I'm in Madrid, baby. Okay, you, that's that's gonna be uh, the the Anthony Goods uh, pin. Yeah, that's where I'm at, man. This All is right. where 
This is where I'm at right now until further notice. Okay. All right. All right. We'll do that. All right, Anthony, appreciate it very much. It's been, it's been a blast. Appreciate you. All right. Uh, Thanks a lot. See you. See you soon. Yes, sir.